everyone is well today. I want to welcome you to the Douglas County Chamber of Commerce's Greystone Power Luncheon, sponsored today by Wellstar Douglas Hospital. We want to thank Wellstar for their generous sponsor, uh, sponsorship and for their tremendous involvement they have in our community. Uh, I am Steve Morgan. I am a financial advisor for United Community Advisory Services right across the street at United Community Bank. And I'm also the uh, chair-elect for 2011 uh, um, Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors. I'm filling in for Mike Stevens today. He's on vacation, so he's allowing me to get a little on-the-job training, which I will definitely need uh, getting ready for next year. Um, but before we begin the program, I would like to ask Miss Tracy Moore with Beulah Elementary to come up. She would like to make a quick announcement. You'll have to bear with me. My general audience is six years old and does not speak English, so bear with me. Well, I teach English as a second language at Beulah Elementary School. And I'm Sheila Miller, the principal of Beulah Elementary School. And we just appreciate the opportunity to come and share with you some of the wonderful programs that we have going on at Beulah and to share with you what we have going on. Beulah houses the state of Georgia's only dual <clears throat> language program, also known as two-way immersion, in a public school. There are a couple of programs that are charter school and one, uh, and I think it's Atlanta International School. It's a very expensive private school. Otherwise, we're it for the state of Georgia. We teach our students in kindergarten, first and second grade, well, a strand of those grade levels. Their day is spent half in English and half totally immersed in, it, in Spanish. They learn the content standards. Nothing changes. When, we, when they are in the Spanish class, no English, all Spanish. And you would be amazed at how quickly these children learn two languages. We're not just teaching them to speak Spanish. They're going to be biliterate, reading, writing, and speaking both languages. Half of the children in the program are native Spanish speakers, half of the children are native English speakers, and they help each other, and it's a very dynamic program. And we'd also like to just share that we are very honored. We just received a grant from the United States Department of Education for Foreign Language so that we can expand our program and offer and invite the community to participate in what we have going on, too. And we are only one of maybe 10 uh, grants that for the entire United States, so we're very honored to receive that. You may have received some information from Chamber about a fast fluency Spanish immersion class that we're hosting at the um, central office of the Board of Education next week, Monday through Thursday. I put a few flyers on the table and it has my email address. Please, if you're interested, contact me and I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. The program teaches language, conversational Spanish, in four days, and I promise you, you learn, in a very authentic way, using motion and action and um, visuals. It's very fun. It's kind of hilarious. There are some videos. You can go to the website for Fluency Fast and watch the videos. Come with an open mind, and I promise you, you'll leave after four days being able to comprehend more Spanish than you imagine. We hope that next year we can bring the program back, if not sooner, for an intermediate level. And we're also going to be hosting programs at Beulah in the evening for beginning Spanish classes. So please take a moment to look at the flyer, see what you think, give me a call. I'm sorry I can't stay with you. I have another appointment. I have to rush out. But give me, a, jot me a note on the email. I'll call you back, answer any questions. And I have to say that I know you all know the importance in this economic global economy of having our students learn a second language so that we hope that you're with us in supporting this program so that we continue at offering more and more students the opportunity to learn a second language. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, Ms. Miller and Ms. Moore for that 
a very interesting announcement. Before we give thanks for today's lunch, I would like to, like to offer a special thank you to Outback Steakhouse. I haven't had a chance to eat yet, and my stomach is rumbling because it smells very good. Um, but what they cater today, it, was, it looks like it was outstanding, and I would like to ask Jackie Biber to please come forward and say just a few <coughs> words. Okay, we'll ask Jackie to come back in just a few minutes. So I would like to introduce Miss Lyric Burnett. She is our the Chamber Summer Intern, and she will lead us in our invocation and the pledge. If you'll all please bow your heads. Uh, dear Lord, thank you for this meal. Uh, please bless this food to nourish our bodies. Please bless all of our jobs, our businesses, our family, and this community. In your name, Lord, amen. Amen. And if everyone will rise with me for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Jackie got word to me that she is extremely busy, and um, but we do appreciate her and Outback, so if you would join me in a round of applause for her meal today. And, and thank you, Larry, very much, and we're very excited to have you at the Chamber this summer. It is time to recognize our small business for the quarter, or the second quarter of 2010. Nominations for the small business of the quarter are sought uh, from Chamber Board of Directors, members, community leaders. Um, these selections are then reviewed by the Selection Committee. Uh, the application, uh, the selection shouldn't, yeah, that's easy enough to say, wasn't it? The Selection Committee reviews the application and makes a decision based on several attributes, including business success and overall community invo involvement. At this time, I would like to ask the Small Business of the Quarter winner, Lee Brogdon Culberson, with Professional Mojo, to come forward. <clears throat> Professional Mojo works exclusively with small businesses to harness the power of social media and amp up web presence to meet the challenges of the marketplace. Congratulations, Lee. Thank you, and great, right great work on my name. Oh, did I get that right? <laughs> you did, you did. Let's step right here All and right. get a quick picture. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you much. So much. Congratulations. <laughs> All right, it is now my pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker, Ms. Susan Thompson. Ms. Thompson is the Executive Director of Government and Community Relations for Wellstar Health Systems. Susan has worked in the Government and Community Relations arena in Georgia for more than 13 years. She began her career at Grady Health System, where she led their local and state policy efforts, efforts for more than five years before accepting a role in the newly created Georgia Department of Community Health, where she worked on community health programs, Medicaid, and state health insurance. In her position at Wellstar, Ms. Thompson is develop, has developed beneficial relationships among local, state, and federal political delegations with a focus on important policy issues such as health care, reform, Medicaid, uninsured, health care workforce, certificate of need, and medical liability reform. You have been very busy. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Susan Thompson. Okay, so I just hit the arrow, right? Yes, I'm supposed to hit. Oh, okay, I might want to do that. Technical <coughs> difficulty, there we go. Well, good afternoon. Thank you so much uh, for allowing me to come and talk to you all a little bit today about some of the post-healthcare reform realities that we are beginning to see come out of Washington as the implementation starts to take fold um, in our local, state, and federal uh, governmental entities. 
As you all know, the bill passed in Congress on March 21st, and since then they have been working a lot behind the scenes to say, okay, now what? We've passed a 2,500-page 25 page bill. It's going to require about 250,000 pages of regulation. We better get to work. We have a lot to do. Um, and I would be remiss if I, since I'm talking about a federal reform issue, if I didn't acknowledge um, Jason Skipper here from Senator Johnny Isaacson's office. Jason is a good friend to Wellstar particularly. Um, Senator Isaacson is very communicative with us on these important issues, has a great passion for health and well-being of our communities, and we really appreciate all the outreach that you all provide to us. Uh, first, just want to kind of throw a few funnies up there. Um, we, it's sort of like all these other presidents are saying, haven't we been here before? Haven't we all tried a little bit of health care reform over the years as President Obama signed that bill in? And this was sort of on the other side of, well, health care as we knew it is, is now gone. Um, the, the sweeping reform efforts are changing pretty much the entire system and delivery of care, which really affects on the provider side and the patient side. But being as this is a chamber and business audience, I really wanted to focus a lot on the employer side and what this means to you all as employers and employees in your different companies, small and large. First, I wanted to back up for just a moment and talk a little bit about why reform became center stage, not only in the presidential election as, as President Barack Obama, then can candidate Barack Obama, campaigned heavily as this was his top domestic agenda item. But truly, for any president, regardless of what happened in that election, health care was going to have to be at the top of the agenda. We're spending, approaching that 20 percent of our GDP, it's at 17 and a half percent right now, of our GDP on health care in this country. It's, it's growing at such an alarming rate and it's not sustainable. So regardless of party, regardless of philo philosophy, we knew that some, some change was coming and we knew that it was coming in, in big, big leaps and bounds. And this is what the projections look like from the Congressional Budget Office over the next, you know, 70 plus years, where, where Social Security and other spending remain somewhat steady. You can see Medicare and Medicaid are predicted to, to just escalate at an alarming rate, which for those of us in the healthcare world is, is truly what keeps us up at night, is how are these changes going to impact what we provide? And then for those uh, folks out in the community and in the business setting, how am I going to be able to access healthcare services? Reform really the center stage from an employer standpoint is all about the insurance reform and market. Uh, for consumers, it, it really is going to look a lot like what initiated out of Massachusetts a couple of years ago. When we saw Massachusetts moving toward, toward an individual mandate that people would be required, just like in many states on your car, you're required to carry insurance, you would be required to shop within certain government and public-private partnership funded health plans to obtain health insurance. Sounded great, sounded like it would actually be something that could work, except as we just heard about two weeks ago, three of the five major health plans that launched in Massachusetts are now about to fold. They could not remain solvent based on the premiums they were taking in and how much they were expending on health care. The whole, the whole game of health care financing is, and, and, and insurance, is that those insurers and those payers have to take in more money in premium revenue than they pay out in your benefits. So when they look at the risk of the people who's sick, who's older, who's not sick, who's got health conditions like diabetes, hypertension, overweight, um, those sorts of things, that's what insurers look at to distribute how much money they think they're going to have to pay out to try to remain solvent. Well, in Massachusetts, it looks like they didn't really have much luck out of three or five of those plans now running insolvent. Um, that doesn't mean they're going to go away. It means that they'll restructure. They'll try to come up with something different, try to restructure their premiums. But the, the whole mindset here is let's learn from that as we're moving forward with a national plan to get into all the local markets to provide insurance, um, not a national health care plan, but national agenda item that will go into the individual states to create opportunities for folks to get insurance. About the, the biggest changes in the state, um, each state will be required to either create their own health insurance exchange product, which will be public-private. The state has the option of if they want to run it state government wise or if they want to contract it out to a third party where they will then collect and create health care benefits that people can price and purchase through that exchange. And the, the thought behind those exchanges are the more people you have coming in, the more premium dollars you have coming in, the more cost sharing and hopefully the healthier balance of, of well people versus people who need a lot more services. Um, the, the good news for the states is that the feds are putting up some seed money to fund those state exchanges. So the first couple of years that they're in operation, once they start in 2014, 2014 and 2015, 
uh, will be funded by the federal government, so they have a little cushion room when they're paying out so many premiums in those first startup years. Um, we can also, as states, co combine with other states, neighboring bordering states, to say, well, let's border with South Carolina and we'll create an exchange that further distributes the risk among those insurance exchanges and allows more people to price their insurance products through these exchanges. And just who's eligible for them, I'll tell you in just a minute. And then one of the other interesting things is that, that each state must have an insurance advocate. Georgia, several years ago, created that office within our Office of Consumer Affairs here in the state government, which basically is supposed to be a, an advocate on behalf of people who are covered by insurance. So when you're getting a hard time, getting a claim paid, or you're being billed that you don't think it's fair, it should be an opportunity to go in and talk with someone who can advocate for you on, and on your behalf. They're resurrecting this approach because they realize um, in the bill that there are going to be hundreds of health plans available. It's going to be very confusing for people. It's going to be, uh, there's going to be some baseline benefits, but some plans may <laughs> offer really Cadillac type coverage and some plans may not. And there's a lot of confusion. It's ripe for folks not to quite understand what kind of coverage they have anymore once they're out in the market on their own trying to shop and price these policies. And quite frankly, if you're on an internet site, you're drawn to the lowest price and you may not get the best benefit or the benefit that's appropriate for you. So this office is intended to help navigate some of that. Um, again, it's a, it's a burden and an expense on the state because now the state's going to have to create staffing, office space, resources to support all Georgians who are now going to be trying to get their insurance. The other options under some of the um, insurance type reforms are that we will see the Medicaid program expanded throughout the country. Um, again, initially it's going to be funded by the federal government, but eventually turned back over to being funded by the state as well. Um, and, and that's how they're proposing to cover part of this 32 million uninsured in our country that are, are slated to be covered or, or estimated to be covered under this new bill. About 16 million of them will go under Medicaid. So as far as the individual mandate, um, essentially it's starting in 2013 at the end of 2013 for the benefit year of 2014. So when you think about, you do your insurance a little bit ahead of time for the calendar year. Um, each individual in Georgia and around the country, and this is absent any changes between now and then, um, will be required to have some form of health insurance, whether it's offered through your employer or you're able to become eligible for Medicaid expansions or any of those sorts of things, as well as some tax subsidies and um, financial benefit that you can gain through the federal government through applying for uh, additional resources to help you afford insurance. So everyone's going to be required to have some type of health insurance product with a baseline of benefits. The federal government has established a set of criteria that essentially are emergency services, surgical services, hospitalization, general basic benefits. Um, there are some wellness pieces added to that as well. Um, it may not cover every provider. It may not cover um, <coughs> every procedure. So that's where the details of all these plans that have yet to be formed that we'll be watching very closely over the next two years to see exactly who's going to cover what and in what way. Um, from a consumer perspective and from a provider perspective, frankly, we really want to make sure our patients have the right coverage when they're, they, they, they're going to see their doctor or they're coming to the hospital. It benefits them and it benefits the provider to be able to continue providing those services. Um, the interesting thing is that also under the individual, um, under taxation, is that currently if your benefits, um, your health costs out of pocket exceed a certain percent on your income tax every year, you can take a credit for those. They're raising that threshold now under the federal law. They're also um, taking out over-the-counter drugs um, and items that you may buy at your local pharmacy from your flexible spending account. Currently, you can get reimbursed out of your FSA or HSA for those types of items. Those will be coming out as well. So that's the biggest, those are the biggest impact items on us as individuals. As far as employers go, most of the mandate applies only to employers with 50 full-time equivalent or full-time employees working more than 30 hours a week. This is essentially a requirement to say that they have to provide some level of coverage and benefit to their employees. If not, there are, there are financial penalties to the employer to pay, and we'll look at those financial penalties in just a moment. And as I said before, the feds have really established the baseline of benefits that employers and everyone, even in those health exchanges, are going to be required to offer to people to become insured. 
If you have less than 50 employees, then your employees would be eligible for the state exchanges and tax credits and subsidies, but at no penalty to the employer. So this is sort of a walkthrough process of what it looks like for employers. These are employers with 50 or more full-time equivalents. At the very first box, you see employer offers coverage. This means the employer has agreed to offer some type of health benefit. If it, we're going to go the top way first. If you have a full-time employee that decides not to get your health insurance through your employer because they consider it unfavorable, too costly, too much out of pocket, then you will be required to pay a fee to the federal government for that person to then have insurance through one of the exchanges or through a tax credit. And that fee is $3,000 annually per employee. So for a lot of companies, it, they're going to be doing the math to say, well, how much am I spending in benefits now um, versus how much is this going to cost me if I decide not to offer a baseline amount of health care coverage and my employees opt out of it and I pay a $3,000 penalty um, for each of the, my employees who goes on some type of government-assisted insurance. The other way it could go is down below where there, none of the full-time equivalents, everyone accepts the, the insurance that the employer offers. And if they accept it, then there's no penalty to the employer. Everybody does okay. But if the, employer, if the employee still rejects a plan, not because it's too expensive, but just because they either get coverage some other way, they decide they're invincible and don't want that coverage, they can either, they have, they're still under the mandate. So they either have to go out and buy their own insurance through an exchange and get no tax credit or no help because their income is going to be too high to qualify for any of that government assistance. Or they go forego their individual mandate requirement and then they'll pay a fee to the federal government every year. In Massachusetts, it started out at $750. In, this, in the bill, it's going to have incremental increases as, and eventually hit a percent of your income, up to 2.5% is the last figures that we saw. The other option is that if you're an employer and you don't offer any coverage and you just decide to forego offering anything to your employees, then and you're at least one or more of your employees go out and get a tax credit because they can't afford insurance on their own, then it'll only be a $2,000 penalty. So if you offer benefits that aren't really good and your employees go out there, you're penalized a little bit more than if you don't offer anything at all. So again, a lot of employers will be looking at that, doing the math of how many employees do I have times $2,000 versus how much am I spending in health benefits every year. And frankly, that $2,000 doesn't seem like a lot, which is the concern, frankly, when health reform was going through, that the goal here was to insure people, bless you, not to drive people out of the insurance market um, and not to drive people into these government um, exchanges and so forth. So that's really been the rub of the outcome is, is this really going to insure more people through these products? And, and frankly, I think it's way too early to tell any success uh, that we'll see out of it. Um, but I wanted to outline those for you because I think a lot of what's come out has been very confusing and will continue to, to be confusing for the next two years as these exchange, state health exchanges, the rules are developed, they, come, they go live in each state. Each state may do something a little bit differently. Some may go with government runs, some may go with contracted. You could see regions develop all over the country. Um, and of course, that's absent any changes between now and, and implementation. So the 10-year implementation timeline, while aggressive, while there's significant sweeping changes that start starting in 2011, we know that there's, there's opportunity to see some of this change through the process. Uh, we certainly have an election cycle this November. We'll have another election cycle before implementation um, really gets cranking in 2015. So we know we'll even have a presidential election cycle at that point. So we know and we expect some changes to be made, but as far as today, and when, when Callie asked me to come and talk about it, it's we have to prepare as though these things are going to happen, at least initially. Um, in fact, I'll get to my um, last slide and I'll come back. Um, we at least have to get to the point where um, we're preparing that these things are going to happen and that we're knowledgeable um, as the process goes forward. We know that the government's going to be making a lot of regulatory changes. We know that um, there's going to be perhaps some legal changes. There, are, there, there is a lawsuit pending with a number of states, including Georgia. We have appointed a special attorney general. Governor Purdue appointed a special attorney general back in March 
to um, allow Georgia to participate in a federal lawsuit blocking the mandated requirements of the federal government onto states. There is case law judicial precedent that the federal government cannot oppress onto the states these financial burdens. Um, so it'll be interesting to see where that, where that litigation goes. It was filed, I believe, in the Northern District of Florida, which is considered more friendly. Um, on this issue, but even as the, even as the legal challenges go through and politics plays out and elections occur, the the current environment up there, Kathy Sebelius, the the Secretary of Health and Human Services, they're moving forward. They're continuing to make rules as though this is all going to happen as it was slated in that legislation. So, from a provider's perspective at Wellstar, we are preparing. We are working daily. Uh, we're still communicating our desires of things that we'd like to see changed, absolutely, but we have to be ready for when these things hit live in 2013, 14, and 15. Um, we will be ready, and um, we will be working very hard with our colleagues in Georgia to, to, to get there. I think Callie's giving me the hook. <laughs> but uh, I'm happy to stay after and, and answer any questions. And I would, be, I would be remiss if I didn't say they always call me Susie Sunshine because I always get to tell everyone just the best news. But I would say exercise your right to vote, exercise your opinion, contact your, your congressman. They do listen. They tell me they hear from their constituents. What does this mean to my people back home? So please continue to do that. It makes, it makes it so much more effective up in Washington when we're up there talking to those guys about really what does this mean back home. And, and we appreciate um, all the support that you all can provide in that area. Thank you. Thank you very much. Help me draw some gold Thank you, Susan, very much uh, for taking time out of your busy schedule. This is a great topic to all of us because it it will affect every single person in this room, and there's no doubt about that. And I could I could sit here a couple more hours and listen to you get me out of the office. Um, but I'm going to ask you to help me draw some door prizes. This is actually lunch for two at any Greystone Power Luncheon through 2010. And it is 618063. Hey, it might be me. Ooh, we have a winner. Woo. There we go. All right, we have some Outback gift cards. $25. From Wellstar. Well, our pleasure. Zero three three. Zero three three. Is it me? Oh. Oh, somebody did one. Lois, congratulations. It's a cooler backpack. All right, we'll give that one away next. A cooler backpack from Quick Concepts. It's really neat. 125. Oh, wow. And a chair, folding chair from Quick Concepts. Oh, I was about to drop. No. 021. 021. Congratulations. Two more gift cards from Outback. Uh, donated by Wellstar, twenty-five dollars. Zero six nine. All right. Jamie. And another twenty dollar, twenty-five dollar gift card to Outback. Zero five four. Was somebody right in oh. line behind me? Video guy. Video. I want to um, remind everyone that we have a ribbon cutting uh, immediately following today for prepaid legal services. We'll be in the foyer. Thanks again to the city of Douglasville for allowing us to use the downtown conference center. Uh, to Wellstar Douglas for hosting the day and uh, for sponsoring the luncheon and Greystone Power for their annual sponsorship. Thank you for all, all of you for attending and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.